I think we're living in a very interesting time. It's a time of crisis. We're in a period of history that is somewhat uh, unusual, where we're in that time where we're making a transition not only from year to year or even in terms of the turn of a century, but rather the time of the turn of a millennium. And of course, any time you have that transition from millennium to millennium, all of the historians and the sociologists and the prognosticators of the future talk about the significance of this moment in history. Now, the historians of our day have described our time as the post-Christian era, a time where the teaching of Christianity has been deemed increasingly irrelevant, a time when the church is seen as a museum, outdated, outmoded. Uh, it's been reduced in certain places of Europe to the, to the role of the mausoleum, indeed the grave site for those who have declared the death of God. And yet there remains in this world today a pulsating group of believing Christian people who still live at this point in time trusting in promises that were made 2,000 years ago. 2,000 years is a long time, and there's some irony in this, in that, that we're at that point now where just about 2,000 years have elapsed since the birth of Jesus. But on the occasion of the birth of Jesus, you recall the angel Gabriel came to this young girl and announced that she would give birth to a baby whose name would be Emmanuel. And this young maiden, under the influence of the Holy Spirit, 2,000 years ago, sang a song. And we all know the song. We love the song. It's called The Magnificat, in which Mary, under the power of the Spirit, sang out, My soul doth magnify the Lord, and my spirit doth rejoice in God my Savior. And if we look through the text of the Magnificat and come to the very end of that song, here are the words that came from Mary. She said, He has helped His servant Israel as He spoke to our fathers to Abraham and to his seed forever." Now shortly after this song of praise inspired by the Holy Spirit from the lips of Mary, uh, another song appears in Scripture, and this is the song that is sung by the father of John the Baptist, Zacharias. And in the midst of his song, he said this, that we would be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to perform the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember His holy covenant, the oath which He swore to our father Abraham." Now here's the irony. We're standing on the threshold of a change of a millennium. We're standing in that point in history being 2,000 years distantly removed from the promises of Christ. And some people are having a hard time believing them because so much time has elapsed, so much time. And yet Mary and Zacharias, ironically, were in virtually the same situation because they were looking back to millennia. They were looking back for 2,000 years and blessing God for remembering a promise that He had made to somebody else 2,000 years before they lived. And so in a very real sense, Mary and Zacharias represent a similar situation to what we are facing today. And both of these people, under the inspiration of the Holy Spirit, celebrated that God remembered something. 
God remembered his promise. He remembered a promise that was a promise to give mercy. And of course, that promise was the promise that he had made 2,000 years earlier to the patriarch Abraham. Now, we've already said that the Old Testament, in a certain sense, is the autobiography of God, that its chief character is God the Father, as His character is revealed in every word that is spoken in the Old Testament text, every deed that is recorded, every relationship that is remembered. But from a human perspective, from the plane of human history, we could come at it in a different way, and we could say, well, the whole record of the Old Testament is a history of the descendants of Adam and Eve. But of course, all history is a history of the descendants of Adam and Eve because they're the parents of all people who have ever lived. In a more narrow and specialized sense, the whole scope of Old Testament history is the history chiefly of the descendants of one man. In fact, if it were a soap opera today, it would probably be called something like this, one man's family. And the man whose family history is recorded throughout the Old Testament literature is Abraham. Now, of course, one of the points of crisis in our time, where this spirit of skepticism that declares that we're living in the post-Christian era is manifested, is in this skeptical attitude towards the historical reliability of the Old Testament, and particularly the earlier chapters of the Old Testament. And in the corridors of biblical scholars and those who indulge in what's called higher criticism, there has been in the last 150 years a massive attack against the historical character of Abraham. Abraham has been regarded as a mythological character, merely a legend whose life gives us some kind of parabolic lesson. Uh, but apart from the moral lessons that we can learn from this saga, there is no real historical substance to it. And of course, in the 19th century, these assumptions were, concer were considered to be assured results of scholarly research. But something has happened, many things have happened indeed, in the 20th century to bring a dramatic change to that spirit of skepticism. The late William Foxwell Albright, before he died, made a sharp rebuke of biblical scholars for ignoring the hard evidence of archaeological research and allowing philosophical speculation to, to bring an undue spirit of cynicism and skepticism to the Old Testament text. And at the heart of this is the story of Abraham. Now this, let me mention in passing a few things that have happened in the 20th century that are very important to our understanding of Old Testament history. In 1929, there was a discovery in Rosh Shamra that proved beyond a shadow of a doubt that writing had been developed as early as the second millennium BC in the Middle East. Because the skeptics of the 19th century said there wasn't even any writing in the world at this time and that the record of Abraham must have come significant later, significantly later because writing hadn't even been developed in this part of the world. In 1935, the Mari tablets were discovered, which indicated a historical record of customs and behavioral patterns that exactly mirrored and duplicated the customs that are recorded in the account of the life of Abraham. Also in the 30s, another dramatic uh, discovery was made with the Nuzu tablets, which did the same thing, gave us a, a wealth of information of Old Testament times and showed a correspondence of customs and behavioral patterns, legal documents, that sort of thing. And then more recently, the Ebla discovery, which there re 
demonstrates the existence of cities, peoples, even names that occur in the Bible, all of which has demonstrated that it seems like every time an archaeologist turns over a shovel full of dirt, another aspect of this record is verified for its authenticity. So what we're going to say here at the beginning is that when we look at the story of Abraham, we ought not to look at the story of Abraham as an exercise in mythology, but rather as an announcement that comes to us in the sacred scriptures of something that takes place in real history, in real space, in real time, where a real God calls a real individual out of a land of paganism, speaks to him, consecrates him, and makes a promise to him that changes the entire course of history. Let's look at that record as we find it in the 12th chapter of the book of Genesis. We read at the very beginning of chapter 12 of Genesis this account. Now the Lord had said to Abram, Get out of your country, from your family, and from your father's house, to a land that I will show you, and I will make you a great nation. I will bless you and make your name great, and you shall be a blessing, and I will bless those who bless you. Some of you will remember the old... Uh, uh, Old Testament survey that was produced by some Lutherans called the Bethel Bible Series. And that